that thing sounds like. Look at this. We got one right here. That looks like a woodpecker or something. Let's see that thing. I know you're up there. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, I mean, that thing will fly down and peck your eyes out in about two seconds. It's built for it. I'll keep an eye on that. Anyway, good morning. <laughs> this is Bill from Curious Cars on a, frankly, it's another beautiful Florida morning. You know, we're in the midst of a cold front happening. It's going to be very cool this weekend, into the 40s, which is just absolutely terrific. Uh, I'm supposed to go fishing with Sean. Uh, the wheel guy. He's like Elvis Presley, by the way. Nobody could make out of wheels what Sean has. I mean, he has managed to turn it into an absolute empire. I mean, you see a guy and you think, okay, he repairs wheels for a living. You know, yeah, he's doing all right. I mean, Sean has parlayed that into... <sighs> You know, like a Donald Trump style lifestyle. I mean, he's got gold toilets and seaplanes and, uh, you know, high end exotic cars and trucks with massage seats. I don't know how the hell he did it. I think he's probably funneling drug money somehow, uh, but he did manage to. But what's interesting about Sean is at the advanced age of 75, uh, he managed recently to have a baby with his much younger wife, which I mean, quite frankly, is absolutely shocking to me. And the baby, well, the baby's now like two or something. And, you know, he's fine. Sean came by the other day and brought him along. I, I was so happy about that because I do love children. And uh, he was running around the shop. And, you know, I thought, wow, isn't it nice? I always hear from people, oh, wait till you have a kid. You're going to love it. You know, he, oh, it changes everything. And, you know, yeah, it changed nothing, you know, in my mind that I could see. Uh, and, and frankly, you know, I don't believe the whole they're going to take care of you when you're old. I think what they're going to do is put you in that nursing home, the one on 60 Minutes where the fire ants eat you. And uh, I have no doubt about that. So that's why I've always worn one of those little rubber things and how I've managed to avoid having children. And frankly, you know, even though Sean's child seems quite nice, uh, if I had ended up with him the way that Sean did, that thing would have been sold into slavery or medical experiments in about 10 seconds. And uh, then I'd have put that money in Bitcoin or something. But anyway, look, I'm going to, it won't digress. I'm going to get right into the car. Uh, we have had some rain lately. I've been trying to do this car since last Thursday. You know, I don't know when this video is going up, but today is Thursday. So it's been an absolute week for me to, abs you know, grab this thing thing and uh, get a video going. The guy who owns it is kind of picky about the rain, apparently. So it took a while. It's from Auto House, by the way, this car, and it is available for sale there. Uh, but it's, you know, taking a week. We usually don't get this much rain in the winter. I don't care. It doesn't, as long as the weather stays cool, that's just absolutely fine with me. And uh, the few days like today where it's not raining are just absolutely beautiful. Um, I'm soon to be homeless. We've ended up selling, I've been trying to, my sister and I ended up living in my dad's, my, it's a long story, but uh, my dad built a, what was a fancy house, you know, 50 years ago and is now just a tear down in a nice neighborhood. I've been trying to get her to sell it. So, uh, you know, we're both in the trust together. She finally agreed and we finally have a deal on it. And I'm telling you, man, that's going through May 1st is the closing. Uh, after that, who knows? I mean, my mission is to live like the Unabomber. I'm going to have a rifle, a beard, a motorhome. I'm going to be in the woods somewhere, and uh, that's how it's going to be. So uh, we'll see. We'll see what happens between now and then, and we'll see what happens afterwards. But uh, so far, that's the plan. Uh, Twitter. I've been screwing around on Twitter quite a bit. I guess it's X now, you know, thanks to Elon Musk buying it. And even though I was never really an Elon Musk fan, I have to say I've kind of become one. You know, not to the point where I'd actually buy a Tesla because 
to me, it's still just a really unattractive looking iPhone on wheels, but I do have to give the guy credit and it has been fun being over there. And if you're not there, come over to Twitter. It's Curious Cars. For whatever reason, it's Cars Curious, at Cars Curious, but it's Curious Cars on Twitter and uh, we're having some fun. I'm posting some car stuff over there, anything that kind of jumps out at me and having some interaction with people and uh, it's all in good fun. So. Anyway, I'm going to leave it there and we're going to jump right into the car. And uh, again, thank you to Auto House and uh, Jacob at Auto House for providing this. You know, he sent me a picture of it over a week ago and I thought, man, I can't believe that in the years that I've been doing videos, you know, I've done like a Morgan Aero Plus 8, but I have never done a Chevy Chevelle. And last week I did a 69 Camaro. Uh, for the first time, which was another one that was shocking that I hadn't got around to. And finally, I get a Chevelle to add to the mix. So I'm very, very happy to have this car. And uh, we're going to jump right into it. And it's a very attractive car. It's a 1968 uh, SS396 convertible. Actually, I do believe it's a tribute car, but yeah, we'll go with SS for the moment. And uh, was a very, very important car to the era of muscle cars and a very successful car for Chevrolet as a whole. Uh, it's finished in Cordovan maroon uh, paint outside, which is just beautiful, uh, with uh, kind of a parchment or, you know, white interior. Very attractive car. Looks great. And if you have any interest in the thing, give the guys at Auto House a call. Uh, but anyway, look, originally the Chevelle was a response to the increasing popularity of smaller cars in the U.S. domestic market, which had been ruled by full-sized cars for years. But then a guy uh, named George Romney, Mitt's dad, uh, ended up taking over AMC after they merged with Kelvinator, and it, it was a big confusing story. And the guy who was going to run it ended up dying, and they ended up giving it to George Romney. And he decided that smaller cars were the future, and uh, AMC got its roots in that. The Rambler American, which I did a video of, I'll post a link to that. Uh, it's a forgotten car now, but it actually sold incredibly well back in the day. Uh, you know, the big three noticed that, and they noticed that AMC's sales took off and made them, you know, a pretty fair competitor, even though they were always in fourth place, but it made them a pretty fair competitor. And uh, this did not go unnoticed by the big three. They had a home in their market for mid-sized cars. You know, Ford had responded to the Rambler with the Falcon, uh, which did quite well. And Chevy GM came out with the Chevy 2, you know, the Chevy 2 Nova, which also did pretty well. Uh, but, you know, sales were waning a little bit. They were a little bit too small for the mass market. And uh, there was a decision made that there would be some mid-sized cars. In 62, Ford came out with the Fairlane. Uh, and that, you know, was met with pretty instant success and, and people kind of enjoyed it. A couple of years later, 1964, Chevy came out with the Chevelle. And in 64, it was the only all-new American car. Uh, it was very well designed. It, it, it came out on a new A platform, uh, which uh, originally was going to be a unibody thing. And then they decided, now nah, we're going to go with the traditional setup. So they made it body on frame. Uh, but it was very modern underpinnings and a very good driving car. And uh, the people responded really well to it. Uh, also old Chevy uh, sorry, Olds, Pontiac, and Buick got an A platform, but they did a good job of differentiating the cars on it. So every car still had its sort of unique look, and uh, the Chevelle was no different. Uh, the name is thought to be a play on the word gazelle uh, instead of <laughs> Chevelle. So they decided not to go with gazelle, which would have matched the Impala, one of their full-size cars at the time. Uh, but they uh, just put a CH in the beginning and made it the Chevelle. And, yeah, I mean, it worked out pretty well. Um, it, it ran for a few years of the first generation. And then in 1968, the year of this car, uh, they came out with an all new redesign and it was considered a design victory for GM. You know, I read a road and track article. They begrudgingly, and I mean, you're talking about 68 road and track. I mean, these were really poncy guys with driving gloves and mutton chops and, you know, SCCA 
MGTD racers and uh, Euro cars. I mean, they just were never a big fan of the, uh, you know, the big American car. Uh, but, you know, one of them used a 327 Malibu to drive to another town, was impressed with it, brought it back to the headquarters at Road and Track. Despite all the sneering and weirdness, some of them drove it and they thought, wow, this is a pretty good car. And uh, they ended up reviewing it and they liked it. Um, you know, they didn't do the SS because, again, you know, Road and Track, they're creepy, but they did a Malibu with the 327 and uh, they thought the thing drove extremely well. And that was a big part of what became the success of the car. Uh, and they admitted that it was a design victory. I mean, Chevy and GM were kind of leading the way on design in the late 60s. They uh, were kind of the first, like with this car, and you could see it more if it were in coupe form, uh, where they did away with the sort of obvious distinction between the bottom and top of the car. I mean, if you look at early 60s cars, you've got the bottom of the car up to the base of the windshield, and then the greenhouse looks obviously very, very different and doesn't entirely blend in. Uh, in this car, it did blend in and became, you know, like in the coupes, there was this big high kickback uh, on the rear quarter panels and a sloping rear end that was almost a fastback. Uh, it borrowed quite a bit from the uh, styling of the new Camaro at the time. You know, it has a little bit of a Coke bottom look to it. Uh, and um, was considered quite a design victory. Uh, it also barred the Camaro idea of having a huge option list to make it very versatile. And that versatility was helped by the availability, unlike the Camaro, you could get this thing as a coupe, a convertible, uh, a sedan, a wagon. Uh, there was a hard top coupe, a hard top sedan. You know, there was just a variety of different body styles, which made it absolutely perfect. Uh, a very excellent choice for a wide variety of sort of upper, lower, and middle-class Americans at the time. You know, it was something that they could go to the Chevy dealer, order in a variety of different ways to suit their needs, from, you know, base cars with six cylinders to extreme hot rods with big blocks and four speeds to sedans to wagons. It just became a very, very versatile, uh, definitive American car. And even though it was midsize, which was... I won't say it was new by 68, in fact, it was really kind of becoming the thing, uh, but it just suited everybody pretty, pretty well, and uh, they were all very happy with it. But look, before we jump into this car, let's take a quick look back at 1968, uh, which was the year that the Cheval landed, and what turned out to be a really significant and tumultuous year for America and for the world at large. I mean, 68... 68 was a pretty fucked up year, but look, there was the Prague Spring. Uh, that's where the Soviet Union invaded Czechoslovakia and uh, arrested and basically deposed its president, who was attempting to free the press and uh, reform socialism in the country. And obviously this wasn't going to be very tenable or, you know, happy news to the Soviets. So they ran the tanks in, uh, they deposed the guy, they, you know, ensconched communism back into the country. Uh, but it ended up being a harbinger of things to come. And of course, you know, a couple of decades later, the Soviet Union would basically base to exist, uh, basically base to be. You know, I took some coronavirus whiskey this morning, not as much as when I did that 69 Camaro. Uh, a week ago, I screwed up on that one. You know, there was a lot of people with illnesses around me, not just coronavirus, but other illnesses. And I thought, man, I better load up on this shit. Well, I loaded up on it too much and uh, it didn't work out well. So I decided to uh, be a little more moderate today. And I think that's worked out better, but I'm still screwing things up. Uh, but anyway, a few decades later, after the Prague Spring, the uh, Soviet Union ended up crushing. So it really was a sign of things to come. Uh, domestically, uh, probably one of the biggest bits of news were the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. We've just had a holiday for him. And um, Robert F. Kennedy, um, JFK's uh, brother. And that, you know, the big deal at the time, very, very troubling to people in the United States and a sign of what was going on. It was just a very 
a very unpleasant year, really. Uh, it, the, so there was a session, and then there were anti-war demonstrations that turned violent for the first time. They were violent in Europe and London. Uh, there was the Democratic National Convention in 68 in Chicago, uh, where uh, Mayor Daley sent the uh, police and the National Guard out to attack Vietnam protesters who were kind of screwing up the program there. And there was a bunch of violence there, all publicized on TV, and uh, just felt like a sign of the you know, the end of sort of the post-war happy period for America. You could tell we were sinking into something else. Um, NASA, they launched the Apollo 8 space mission. Uh, North Vietnam and Viet Cong troops launched the Tet Offensive, uh, which um, ultimately, you know, it, it, on paper was apparently a failure, uh, but it was a PR victory and kind of... It ruined the American will to keep going in Vietnam. That was kind of the beginning of the end for America over there, even though we took it over from the French. A lot of people forget that. It was France that got us into that crap, uh, the same way it was England that got us into Iran. So, you know, go easy on America. We haven't always led the way. We've kind of been dragged into it, kicking and screaming. Uh, but anyway, the Tet Offensive kind of screwed things up over there. Uh, the Boeing 747 made its major in flight, one of the most beautiful and incredible aircraft of all time, and you know, frankly, even though I'm not a huge aviation guy, uh, my dad was in the travel business uh, with me growing up, and I flew in a lot of 747s, and you know, I didn't realize how lucky I was at the time. What a beautiful aircraft. 9-11, uh, the 9, 11, the 9, not 9, 11, the 9 -1 -1 emergency system came out in 68. You know, before that, you had to look up the number for the police and call it. Uh, after 68, you could just tap 9 -1 -1 and get a recorded message. Uh, Intel, didn't know it was that old, but it was started in 1968. The Intel Corporation, a guy named Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce, uh, and obviously that went on to do some interesting things. And the first ATM came out in Philadelphia, which <laughs> probably the first ATM robbery as well. We're talking Philly, but um, you know people could go up and get an automated bank machine as early as 68. And frankly, until I looked all this stuff up uh, in my research, I had no idea. I would have thought uh, the ATM came out much, much later. Um, a guy named Dr. Christian Bernard, he performed the first successful heart transplant, uh, obviously a big step forward in uh, medical stuff. Uh, Dutch elm disease was running rampant, uh, tens of thousands of trees now destroyed to the chagrin of, you know, the Sierra Club members everywhere. And in other tree news, the Redwood National Park was created uh, in California to protect the giant redwoods, which... Yeah, great, you know, nice big trees, might as well hang on to them. Uh, most important, in 68, the first Big Mac goes on sale at McDonald's, uh, costing 49 cents. I think it's like $14 today, uh, but it was 49 cents back then. A huge year for films and music. Uh, you had The Graduate, uh, you remember that with... Um, What's his face? The little guy, Dustin Hoffman. His uncle actually was very important in the car world. Uh, but um, what's her name? Is it the sexy legs on Mrs. Robinson? You have Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, uh, another big movie. Bonnie and Clyde came out. Uh, Valley of the Dolls, uh, The Odd Couple, which of course would go on to be a great TV show, Planet of the Apes, possibly one of my favorite movies of all time. And uh, I'll tell you what, there's a scene in that movie which is even gayer than the scene in Rocky II, where uh, Apollo and Rocky are sort of bouncing together in tight shorts and halter tops inside the ocean, which I thought was a really, really, and I look, not that there's anything wrong with it, it's just making a point. Uh, I thought that Rocky thing had the gayest scene ever, uh, but there's this scene in Planet of the Apes where you've got these three naked guys doing weird, and look, if you go and look at it, it's pretty fucked up, so, uh, but anyway, a tremendous movie, and everybody loved the ending of that thing. Uh, you also had Rosemary's Baby, uh, which uh, scared the crap out of me as a kid, and, you know, now it just seems like any baby to me, you know, that that's basically the same view I have of them. Music, it was a huge year. You had the Rolling Stones, 
doing their thing. You had the Beatles, of course. Uh, Fleetwood Mac was around. Uh, Aretha Franklin doing her thing. The Grateful Dead was out, you know, creating a generation of goofballs. Uh, the Monkees on TV. Uh, Simon and Garfunkel singing about whatever the hell it is they did. Uh, the Beach Boys, the Bee Gees, I didn't know they were out that early, but they were. And uh, Jimi Hendrix and, uh, of course, The Doors. And I was a big fan of The Doors as a kid because I really liked getting really, really drunk and uh, popping whatever anyone would give me. But, you know, that's changed. <laughs> I'm not quite the same Doors fan that I used to be. Uh, Pink Floyd... Uh, the Moody Blues, Marvin Gaye, and uh, David Bowie starting out his thing. So, I mean, 68 was a pretty huge year uh, for news, for technology, for unrest, for insanity, for war. Some consider it to be the turning point, a seminal year uh, that led us out of the sort of happy post-war era and into the sort of modern America that we now know. Yeah, that modern America. So anyway, look, I'm going to pause it for a minute there. Um, I will say it was the year that muscle cars uh, and the muscle car craze shifted up another gear, which is why this car exists. Uh, but we'll get into that in a minute. I'm going to take a two minute pause and uh, get my act together and we'll be right back. Bear with me. So as I was getting my shit together today, I saw that Peter ended up buying a new Porsche. I haven't seen this one around here before, so uh, something he ended up with. Not sure if this is a Taycan or... Uh, I like those, by the way, the electric cars with the turbo, you know. We really have come full circle. Uh, you know, the engine in this um, Chevelle I'm doing is a turbo fire, and of course there's no turbo to be seen. Uh, and here we are now in 2024, and uh, Porsches have turbo models that are all electric, so <sighs> the more things change. Anyway, so he's got this great new Porsche. It appears to be a diesel engine, so definitely not electric and uh, looks very, very sporty. I'm not sure how it does on the spid, uh, skid pad or what kind of horsepower it's out with. But anyway, there it is. He um, had mentioned it to me actually a couple weeks ago if I wanted to do a video on it. So let me know in the comments section if you think it's worth doing. Uh, obviously, it's got a good story, you know, but um, I'm not sure that anyone wants to hear it. So let me know and uh, we'll see if we can't do a video on Peter's exciting new one seat Porsche. All right, so let's jump right back into this thing. I'm wearing a body camera today, you know, police style. Um, not sure how it's working. I have it clipped on. If it looks good, I'll put some footage from it in this video. If it looks like crap, as I suspect it will, um, then you won't see any, but we'll give it a shot. Uh, but anyway, look, back to 68. So despite it being a really crappy year, uh, certainly a seminal year in a variety of ways, it was also the year that the muscle car craze shifted up another notch. And obviously it had been going for a while. You know, people wanted big motors, lightweight cars, and, you know, stoplight to stoplight racing. In 68, that really uh, went up another notch. Uh, the SS package was a big deal. It had been out in the first gen, but it really became a much more serious event in this second generation Savelle, the Chevelle. And to many people, it's considered to be the ultimate muscle car. You know, uh, certainly going into the Chevelle SS 454 from 1970, which is really, if you, if you look in Webster's dictionary under muscle car, there's probably a picture of that. Uh, you know, it's a mid-sized car, huge engine, fairly lightweight, uh, tremendous power options, a variety of different high performance stuff. Uh, that was truly peak muscle car. And also GM sort of swan song uh, as it went from, you know, the end of the muscle car area into sort of the beginning of the government regulated safety emissions, big bumpered personal luxury coupe crap that led to all the malaise in the 70s. Uh, but this car, this Chevelle, the second gen Chevelle is uh, widely considered to be peak muscle car. And uh, I would certainly have to agree with that. Uh, most uh, any SS 
396 uh, in 68 came with a black bottom uh, underneath that white stripe and trim piece, which this doesn't have, so it really could use that to get correct. Uh, but um, it uh, was very, very distinctive. It also had very distinctive badging. Uh, it had the twin dome hood, which you can see there. Looks very, very cool. Love the quad lights up front. It had a blacked out grill, the SS396 badge at the front. Uh, I love those scalloped headlights. I just think they look absolutely uh, beautiful. Very, very attractive. Uh, going into uh, almost a Coke bottle side, you know, again, complementing the Camaro. You could see the rally uh, wheels, which look great on this. At the time, these were considered to be quite big wheels and tires and very grippy. Uh, push button door handles. Uh, you can see this one as the convertible. Doesn't have that big kick up on the side, which um, is quite cool, but it does have a flowing Coke bottom look with a haunch there in the back that's quite muscular and tapered door line uh, over the door handle. Looks good. The white stripe down the side looks good. Uh, going into the back, you've got sort of very elegant and minimized taillights. They look nice. Uh, you got a Hearst equipped shifter badge. You got twice pipes coming out the bottom. Good looking chrome bumper in the pre five mile an hour bumper days. Uh, 68 was the first year you had to have side marker lights. You see those taillights wrap around in the back. Uh, good looking chrome trim around the wheel wells and up front you've got the 396 badge with the side marker lights there and uh, that's a pretty good indication that you're dealing with a 68 or newer car. Uh, I also like the stainless and chrome uh, windshield surround looks nice you got a little bit of bling there on the back uh, with the uh, vents on the back of that twin dome hood. Let me grab the key here while we'll I look inside the trunk. Now I've already looked in the trunk and we're not going to be able to see too much because this guy who owns this car has it absolutely loaded with parts that he bought uh, with every intention of installing them and then just never did. So they come with it now, but he was going to make this thing much more of a hot rod. Uh, you've got a couple of aluminum heads there. You've got an yeah, Edelbrock intake manifold, uh, Magnafoam mufflers, and some other stuff. Um, it, this is all going to come with the car, uh, but it was never installed as intended. And it's nice to have the um, uh, the option there, especially with the aluminum heads. Pretty damn cool. Uh, but anyway, good sized trunk. You had a full size spare under there. Uh, you know, being a mid sized car then is like a giant car now. And um, you'd be able to fit all kinds of crap. You can see all the crap you could fit in the back. If those were toddlers, you'd be stacking them. Uh, like Sean's kid, you could have him and four of his friends back there. And uh, they'd be pretty safe and happy. Uh, also like that SS396 badge, so anyone behind you knows you got some beef under the hood. Uh, there's a story of Patrick Bedard. A uh, very famous car and driver writer talking about these cars back then. And uh, he said, um, you know, a lot of street racing going on. We'll get under the hood to talk about this, actually. He said, if you could hear 16 little hammers uh, when you were, you know, sitting next to one of these at a stoplight, uh, you knew the guy had the 375 horse option and he was dangerous. So, uh, but we'll get into that. Let me get this hood up. I'm going to have to put the camera down for a minute to do that. Oh God, all right, everything's hard. Everything really is at my age. Uh, but here you can see it. Here is a big block Chevy, one of the greatest, one of the greatest engines ever put under the hood of any car. I mean, there is just something. So I actually give the small block more credit in terms of being the most versatile and lovely and smoothest engine of all time. Uh, but there is just something phenomenal about a big block. And uh, in 68, there were three different ones you could have uh, in the Chevelle, in the SS396 package. Uh, there was the um, standard 325 horse, 
Uh, then there was a 350 horse that was a little upgraded. And then there was an L78 package, which was a very expensive engine. Not a lot of people opted for it. But that had 11 to 1 compression, solid lifters, and uh, that was an absolute street monster. You know, probably made it to a Muncie 4 speed, 12 bolt rear end with maybe a 488 or something. Uh, it was a true heavy duty street racer, but it pumped the price of this thing up big time. Uh, under here, you can see everything looking pretty nice. You got an original Delco style battery with one of these, you know, Frankenstein monster type uh, electrical disconnects. I love throwing that switch, you know, it's alive, alive. You got um, uh, your underhood light working, the padding, the paint all looks nice, big chrome valve covers. Still has the uh, factory uh, exhaust manifold, so, you know, pretty untouched, although it appears to have some sort of double pumper carb with uh, stainless lines and uh, braided lines and a fuel pressure gauge, as well as an HEI distributor, which I do not believe it would have had in 68, but somebody out there will probably correct me. Uh, and everything looking very nice under there, and simple, and easy to work on, and easy to own, which again, was part of the beauty of these cars, and part of why they're such impressive and easy to own collectibles today. Uh, if you didn't get the SS package, there were more, you could get a six cylinder, like the uh, Thriftomatic or something. What the hell was the name of it? Um, a turbo thrift. Again, no turbos to be found anywhere, uh, but that was the name that they used. So there's a 140 horsepower turbo thrift six. Uh, there was a new 200 horsepower turbo fire 307, uh, which was also used in the Camaro, and a 325 horsepower version of the 327. Uh, then you got into the big block SS cars. You could also, by the way, one of the problems problems for collectors on these things is the SS stuff was not necessarily uh, represented in the VIN and body tag. So you could end up with a Malibu, which was a higher end version of the Chevelle, uh, that had a big block, that had a four speed, that had disc brakes, that had all the stuff SS's might have, but it wasn't an SS. But there's no way of really knowing that. So um, D constructing these cars for collectors is extremely difficult and uh, if you're buying one and you're paying up for you know uh, what it's supposed to have come with yeah you better if you don't know hire somebody who does and make sure you're getting what you pay for uh, they're very very tough cars to document and in fact there's even now uh, not just cloned cars, you know, Malibus and six cylinders that became SS's, but there's cloned paperwork. So uh, you can't be absolutely positive what you're getting without some pretty heavy duty research. So uh, you got to be a little careful with that. Uh, generally, the SS's would have had a Turbo Hydra 400 tranny transmission, or it would have had the uh, Muncie four speed. You could even get a Rock Crusher in them. Uh, otherwise, the non-SS cars, you could get a three-speed manual, uh, you could get a power glide. Uh, just again, at the time, options were a very valuable thing for GM. It was making them a lot of money, and they had a huge, huge option book, uh, which um, people could dive into and take any car, any Chevelle, from its base price of, you know, 2600 or so, up past $4,000 uh, into uh, something that made GM some money. Uh, you had an independent front suspension with uh, wishbones, very, very nice, coral spring shot. Uh, and getting back into how this had sort of a modern setup for the time, it had a trailing link uh, rear axle, you know, a live solid rear axle, but with trailing arms uh, holding at coil springs and shocks, which handled very well. Uh, power drums were standard. You could get front discs, and uh, it had a recirculating ball steering, which, um, uh, according to Road and Track, wasn't quite as much feedback as they wanted, but not as assisted as they would have suspected from GM at the time. Uh, they said it gave you a pretty decent feel. And believe me, when Road and Track saying that about a Chevelle in 68, that's really high praise. Uh, anyway, I'm going to pause there. I'm going to get all my crap inside. Actually, I tell you what, I can't use the trunk, so let me show you the back seat before I stuff everything in there. Uh, your Canadians are going to be very, very chipper back there. No question at all.
Uh, you could fit uh, three across, no problem. You see it's got seat belts. You see it got pretty good leg room. Uh, this one has power windows. So these little quarter windows are power operated. Uh, you got a couple of ashtrays, which appear to be covered up. Guy doesn't like smoking in his car. Uh, which is a shame because, of course, this car was made to be smoked in. And uh, otherwise, everyone's going to be fairly happy back there. And, of course, the uh, convertible top is back and folded. And that is a power top. So, you know, not a car without some luxuries. you got a power top. you got power windows, uh, power steering, power brakes. Uh, this one has a center console. You know, it's... Eh, pretty well equipped. You could almost make them sort of mini Cadillacs, which isn't bad for a mid-sized GM car at the time. Anyway, let me get my crap in the back seat, then we're going to hop in the front, have a quick look, and then go for a drive. All right, so I've got my tag deployed, top down. We're going to keep it down, uh, put a light jacket on. It's still probably about 60 degrees, so what a gorgeous day. Sun's now coming out. Uh, to uh, to drive a Chevelle drop top. Absolutely perfect. Um, yeah, there's the push button thing. If you have a look inside, this one has the Stratos bucket seats. Uh, could have had a bench up front, even in the SS models. Uh, seating for six in a mid-sized car. So, you know, there it is. A convertible from the 60s is an SUV of today. Um, you got a wood steering wheel, which is kind of an SS type setup with the uh, badging in the center, 396. Good looking piece. You see those in Mopars a lot too. Uh, door panels, nice and tight. Um, a lot of trim in there. A little twisty vent windows, which work great. There you see the power window switches. And uh, the buckets, very, very comfy. Nice to drive in. Uh, center console. There's that um, four-speed shifter, the pattern, little saddle thing to hold the seat belts. I don't think that's factory, but there's the SS uh, badging in the uh, center console, all looking good. A couple of accessory cup holders, which is fine. If you only fire this thing up and move it forward to get out of the sun a little bit and do that, we've got our ignition up here in kind of an odd spot. And a little shift. Let's see, I think had a couple of kill switches. Yeah, they're engaged. And a fan switch down there, which I'll engage. And there's that big black Chevy firing to life, which just again sounds like no other engine in the world and really, really is one of the loveliest. Uh, you know, cars to drive around. Really a terrific feeling driving a big block Chevy. Uh, you got a couple of rectangular gauges there, a huge variation in gauge package you could have. You could have full gauges in this thing, uh, tacks and, you know, whatever else. This one doesn't, uh, but you do have a tack and aftermarket thing. Bosch, which was an interesting choice, uh, right there strapped to the center console, or sorry, the uh, column, uh, which is a common, you know, usually you'd have a sun tack if it was going to be period correct, and it would be strapped much the same way. Uh, 120 mile an hour speedo. Over here you got your headlights. You've got, um, what the hell are these here? Wash and wipes. Okay, so those are your hidden wipes. With 68, the uh, hidden wipers were an option. Uh, later on it became uh, standard across all of them. Uh, here you've got, um, this is your cigarette lighter, which is interesting. Uh, obviously been used because, yeah, that's what, you know, this car was made for. Ignition beneath at your climate control. This is an upgraded old style radio with Bluetooth. Uh, there's a clock. It appears to have LED lighting, so it's probably a repro in there. And uh, your idiot lights on, uh, on the four corners around it. Fuel, oil, temp, gen. And uh, three gauges here to make sure everything's working good. Uh, very small ashtray for the period, which is interesting. And a uh, glove box over here, which, eh, it's not opening for me immediately, so I'm not going to screw with it. And uh, SS396 badge on the dash. Uh, good looking center view mirror. It's got a day-night setting and uh, what appears to be a light as well, maybe a map light there. So pretty, uh, pretty high-end stuff and uh, a couple of sun visors. 
I'm under strict orders with this thing not to uh, to beat it up. I have to pussyfoot it, uh, which is fine because honestly, in this day and age, uh, while it may have been a race car back in the day, it's much more of a cruiser now. So I will honor their wishes and you know not beat the crap out of it the way that I'd like to. Okay, you see what I've done here. It's gone too far and the gate's not opening. So let me back up, see if we can trip it. Yep, there we go. And there is something absolutely lovely about having a small block or a big block and uh, four speed. The, uh, the shifting just adds a whole new dimension of joy uh, to drive in the car in my mind. You know, you got this beautiful loping sound out the back, uh, distinctly American V8, and uh, then you're rowing your way through the gears. It's just an absolute treat. There you hear that thing, beautiful torque out of it. Obviously, that's what it's meant for. And it's just such a fantastic cruiser. I mean, it really, oh, geez, there, let me give me a little more clutch on it. Uh, it's just a fantastic cruiser. It's an absolute joy to drive this thing. Uh, the power steering feels nice. I can see what Road and Track was talking about. I mean, it definitely has a better steering feel uh, than it could be expected for kind of a Luxo Barge American car at the time. And uh, that's one reason they would have loved it. But you know, it's a very good driving car. And of course, a modern rear end with the trailing link, not independent, but still pretty damn advanced for 68. And uh, that's, again, didn't have too much body roll. Uh, you know, held the ground, held the road pretty good. Uh, you were able to flick it into corners, overcorrect, give it a little bit of oversteer. Uh, it was a very, very fun car to drive by all accounts. And man, what great torque. The one that they used uh, tested had a power glide, which they said was ridiculous uh, to have a two-speed automatic as late as 1968. But um, it was because of that versatility of the 327 uh, and its torque curve that made it possible. And they said that's how they were able to get away with it. So the power glide ended up being a pretty nice option. Obviously, you can keep up pretty good with the flow of traffic. So I do these. Uh, Manually shifting with uh, the camera is kind of a pain in the hole. Oh God, there we go. Uh, but anyway, what a terrific driving piece. What a fun car to drive. You know, top down, perfect weather for it. Uh, obviously a tremendous collector car. And um, the reason being they made a bunch of them. There's a lot of support out there, a lot of parts, new, repro, used, all out there. There's a, a huge fan base, a huge support network, and uh, an endless, endless option list uh, to set up the car however you want to set it up. So just a tremendous amount of fun to have one of these things. Uh, if you're interested in this one, you can get it at um, Auto House, give those guys a call. Jacob's down there, very nice guy. He hooks me up with some of their cars sometime and I'm happy to have them. Uh, nice to finally do a Chevelle. And uh, otherwise, I'm gonna keep plugging along. I might be, uh, Ulf says he has a Rolls Royce for me tomorrow. He was the guy who was attacked by a duck, uh, the German. The duck really screwed him up bad. I mean, he looked like he was in a street fight afterwards. Uh, one day I really want to do that story, but I won't get to today. Uh, but anyway, if you have an interest, uh, give those guys at Auto House a call. I'll get something else to do, and we will see you with the next one. Take care.